Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer and I'm going to be your host for this afternoon. And welcome to this live webinar that is being organized as part of the Business Management Virtual Work Experience powered by SpringPod. Now, whether you've just got started with your program or whether you've been doing it for a while now, we really do hope that you are enjoying yourself. And please do not forget that if you have any questions, you can use the green chat icon in the bottom right corner if you need any help from a member of our team. Now, just before we get started with this webinar, it is useful for you to know a few things. So this talk should last around 30 minutes. And please do not forget to use the Q&A function to ask any questions to our guests that you might want to ask today. They would love to answer your questions and they are here to help. So please make the most of the time you have with them. Now, due to the number of questions that sometimes come through, we may not be able to answer all of the questions. So you can use the upvote function. This is basically the little thumbs up. Um, and it just means that the most popular questions will rise to the top of the list and we will ask those questions to our guest first. If you do miss the webinar or you need to leave halfway through, do not worry, we have you covered. So this will be available within 24 hours for you to watch on demand to your heart's content if you missed anything or you just want to go over anything. Now, in today's webinar, we are going to be talking about marketing and customers. And joining us to do that is Mark McCulloch, who is the founder and CEO at Supersonic. So welcome, Mark. I believe you have some slides to go through with us first, and then we'll go for a Q&A at the end. That's right. Thank you so much. Uh, coming live and direct from sunny, well, not so sunny, uh, Brighton. So uh, welcome to you all. Thanks for taking the time um, to sit and listen to me. And, and hopefully it will be a bit of fun and you'll get a lot out of this as well. So as we were saying there, my name is Mark McCulloch, and I'm a virtual chief marketing officer which means that I've got a nice variety uh, in my life of clients. So I have one client per day for each day of the of the week, and then I work with them weekly. So it's really fantastic, really nice way to sort of get variety and get lots of different challenges. And I do that for the hospitality industry, the tech industry, and the business to business side of things as well, that can be sometimes quite underserved. My history then has been uh, when I was a little boy, I was first of all at the music magazines, which was fun. They, most of them don't exist anymore because I'm old. Um, but then went to travel site and lifestyle site lastminute.com and absolutely loved uh, working there. It was brilliant and was brought up in digital at its very early invention. Then Barclay Card, uh, working for the, the banking side of things and a really nice way to understand what blue chip and big companies are all about. Then I started to get into my passion, which really is food and drink and hospitality. So I started working at Yosushi and was marketing director there, then on the board. Then went to a Spotify competitor called Blinkbox Music. Then to Preta Monji that you might know um, if you've ever had a sandwich uh, in a city anywhere or a town. Usually it's, it might be one of those. So I was there as well as marketing director and on the senior exec team. And then I started life on my own as a consultant. So uh, Started an agency in London for a while doing brand, marketing, digital, social and employee engagement. Very important to engage your employees and your brand as well as your customers. And then started Supersonic on my own. Uh, just really enjoyed being a bit of a, a lone wolf and a lone striker um, and actually doing the work again rather than doing a business. So it, it was great, been great fun so far. And I work with clients at the moment like the Shum, uh, the, the Indian brand that you might know, the Bombay brand, um, and then across the years work with people like Costa Coffee, Buzzworks up in Scotland, um, Store Kit app, and, and many, many others that you might see in hospitality. So today what we're going to talk about the importance of marketing in business, and you can see here why it's so important. And really what marketing does is supercharge your business to help A, keep you relevant, and B, help you win the race. So when you look at this, Pret have stayed strong and they're still number one in their market, even with lockdown and all these things, they'll come back and it'll be fine. And it was because they looked after their teams, which partially is marketing as well. They looked after the customer and they stayed relevant for the customer as well. So you've always got to keep moving. When I was at Blink Box Music, for example, we were never close to Spotify and we never got near Spotify. So 
think Box Music's a great company, you know, it worked really well for its customers, etc. But to really win, you had to do what Spotify was doing, constantly innovating, constantly reaching out to customers, and constantly always reaffirming the perception that they had in, in their minds of what Spotify was all about. Yo Sushi, when I worked there, we were sort of going to toe-to-toe -to -toe with Wagamama, but then through the years, Wagamama has put its foot on the gas marketing-wise, and also strengthened its brand, which I'll come on to what that means soon. But again, that's what gives you the clear blue sky between you and your competitors. Barclay Card's the same. You know, it still exists. It still makes a lot of money. But there's new players in the market. And to me, Barclay Card should own Klarna. They should have invented Klarna, for example, in terms of this new way to pay. And that's what you'll find these bigger, older, legacy brands they're not as agile anymore so if you imagine a speedboat versus uh, an oil tanker in, in the ocean you can't turn around an oil tanker quickly so with these big brands they rest in their laurels they believe their own hype and then they just get a bit old and stayed and they don't look to innovate all the time and just as a thing on Bartley card back in the day it was the first ever uh, transactional card that happened and it was the first ever contactless card that happened as well. Um, but for some reason, they seem to have stopped inventing. And then lastminute.com, when I was there, we were the, the kings and queens of, of travel and leisure. And then over the years, it slowly got worse and worse and worse and worse. And now you've got all of these brands like Airbnb um, and these types of uh, companies where you know they don't even own any property, but they're just a, an amazing service. So again, to me, Hilton or lastminute.com or someone like that really should have invented that type of thing. So that's the sort of brands that I've been working with as well over the years. Um, so you'll, you'll know and love a few, hopefully, um, but mainly in the hospitality space and leisure space. So the importance of marketing within a business. So there's really, in terms of marketing, really sort of three parts to it. So you always think about three things when you're writing a marketing plan and you want to think about the control that you have over the messaging you know down in the bottom axis the, the x-axis and then the y-axis the reach how far is that going to take you so i would absolutely drum that into your head if anyone ever asks you to write a marketing plan just think about these three things owned media paid media and earned media so your owned media, so let's say you're, you're a company and it's Joe's Hot Dogs and that's your brand, then you can say, what are all of the channels that I own? And you've got ultimate control over those. So your shop window, your packaging, your staff uniforms, your website, your email signatures, your social media channels, etc., etc. You own or are in control of all of those. And then what a lot of brands do, especially in hospitality, um, they don't have a lot of budget to spend. You very rarely see food and drink restaurant brands on TV advertising, for example. So you'll see McDonald's, of course, and things like that, but you don't tend to see a lot of others. So they usually play a game where they do, they squeeze the most, as much as they can out of owned media, the stuff that's a free, in inverted commas. And then they go to the top and they do earned media. So they'll always hire a PR agency usually. And then they'll see what people are saying about them online and they'll engage with that. But they won't do the middle bit. So what will get you the furthest is having owned media and having that as tight as it possibly can be. Always correct information. Always got the right campaign on there, things like that. Then you'll pay some money to reach people you wouldn't normally reach that are your target audience. And then from there, you'll then get PR and earned media word of mouth, people saying good things about you on social media as well, um, and in the street, in the pub, whatever. Um, and then also you'll read about it on news sites and the papers and, and things like that. So that's a way to always think about it. If someone says to you, I want to sell this product, I want to sell more of this product, I want to get more hotel bookings, whatever it is, you sit down and you say, right, my plan is in three areas. And Owned will only take you so far, you can see. Paid will take you a little bit further. And then earned, but all three together, that's how far it can take you. That's the way I would always look at it. 
So there's two parts that are often misunderstood in this whole thing, and they're brand and mark brand and marketing. You know, so they're two distinct things. But really, really, we should hold hands and and be part of each other. Um, and it's really misunderstood a lot of the time where you just have a market department and no one looking after the brand at all. Or what can happen is you have the brand and marketing department start fighting with each other. That's not good either because the brand department see the marketing department as cheap and nasty and the marketing department just see the brand side of things as you know ineffective, quite snobby, stuck up, things like that. So you get these tensions. The best thing you can do is just have one department that's all trying to do the same thing. So when I say the word brand, what is it that you think of? You know, is it a certain company? Is it a logo, a color, et cetera, et cetera? You know, this is what you have when you talk about brand. Most people go to a logo or a company or something like that. But brand is much, much deeper and wider than that. It's not just a logo. It's not just a color. It's not just a name. Um, you know, all these types of things. So branding is not brand, but it is definitely a part of it. And brand, to me, and most other people, is much more important than marketing. Get your brand right and the product right and all that stuff, the culture and all that thing, great stuff inside, and your marketing should start to take care of itself. It'll be easier. So no matter what football team you support, and, and certainly not after Sunday's result, um, you know, Manchester United were a great example of this. And Alex Ferguson, I've seen him speaking a couple of times, and, and he said, great thing and he said there's basically sort of one thing that made them so great back in the day which was they only ever worried about three years time and not this Saturday's game and brand and marketing is a little bit up like that but you need to look after both so what I would counsel and advise to you is that you always have a two-speed plan so you have a long-term brand plan of what you want people to think about your brand and build that up in their mind over time because it takes time. And then the other part is the short-term marketing, short-term tactics, you know, selling more of this thing, um, you know, having a sale, whatever it's going to be, you know, all these short-term tactics. The problem most people have is they concentrate on the short-term marketing and they never think about the brand over the long term. So the way I would define brand is it's a promise. So a brand is a promise delivered. So if you pick up a pair of Nike trainers or Heinz beans or the next Apple phone or whatever it is, be very different from you picking up a Nokia phone, you know, Gola trainers or, you know, name your brand or uh, indeed, um, you know, the supermarket's own beans. So it's very, very different. And what brand does, it really elevates your product in the mind of your customers. It stands for something. It's not just a commodity. So... A handbag is a commodity, but you stick coach on it, all of a sudden, you could put that price up for two or three thousand pounds. Then, cup of coffee, you know, you maybe think, what, a pound maybe? All of a sudden, you'd spend three pounds on this if it's got the Starbucks logo on. And that's the power of brand. That's the power of what people know about. And then, if you look at a Dell laptop and you change that to an Apple logo, you know, the latest Apple uh, MacBooks that have came out, fully loaded with everything in, they're six, seven thousand pounds now. I can't believe that for a laptop. There's no Dell on earth, I don't think, that would be worth that. Um, you know, you could probably buy twenty. So from that point of view, brand equals profit. So when you think about brand as well, there's three parts to that. So there's your culture, what it's like on the inside to work there. There's your products and services. And then, you know, what you do. And then your reputation, what people think of you. So if you think of somewhere like Ryanair versus Virgin Atlantic, you know, the, the airplanes, you would sit and you have very different pictures in your mind, what it's like to work at Ryanair, what they do, and what people think of them. And most of the time, it's not nice, you know, in, in terms of what people might think. But if you think about Virgin, you're thinking about quality and looking after each other, you know, only the best, you know, all these types of things. So depending on the brand you are, it's interesting to see what you're all about. But the trouble is, if your culture, your products and services and your reputation aren't meshed together, then the biggest problem here is that you're going to lose pounds because everything's pulling in the wrong direction. 
So what you want to do is you want to define what your brand DNA is. You want to try and get your brand down to a couple of words. Um, so if I take Nike back in the day, it used to be all about maximizing personal performance. That was its brand DNA. And then what, how that was expressed on the outside was just do it, it still is. But from that point of view, that's what it was all about. So when you hire someone, they would understand that. So that would be the criteria for hiring them. What you make reinforces that and what people think of you is reinforced by that, by the people and the products and services. And then once you've found that thing, you want to align everything, have a plan that's going to say, how do we get all these things to overlap? It's not going to overlap perfectly because life ain't perfect, but you can get it damn close. And then if you're aligned, you're efficient, streamlined, aerodynamic, all these things, that means you'll make more money. And if you keep doing that, your profits will be sustained. And then ultimately in corporate life, most people want to have good shareholder value. You'll hear people talking about that. That's the ultimate goal. Keep your shareholders happy. And then with your brand, you'd want to lay all of this out. So brand, brand position, etc. I can send a link uh, to you on how to go about this process that may be quite interesting for you. So we'll be able to do that today, but I'll send that across to you. And then, of course, the only thing that matters is what all of these people think of you. What are they chatting about? What are they saying to each other about you? Are you even on the radar? So again, that's your job, is just to take a couple of wee cells in that person's brain that if they're in the market for a pizza or a pair of trainers or a soft drink, whatever it is, you're one of the three or four things that they're thinking about and they're thinking good things about you, which will create preference, which means they'll buy from you. And then when I say the word marketing, what do you think of? Well, usually it's seen as maybe the sleazier end of it's just advertising. You know, what is Coke Zero uh, sugar taste like, you know, a Coke? So from that point of view, it's a strap line, it's an ad, it's a thing, you get an award for it, whatever. But it's not just that. And it's certainly not just discount coupons and things like that. But again, a lot of people think that way in business that don't understand marketing. You know, all the way to TikTok, you know, everyone will talk about social media at the moment and say it's the way to sell. And, you know, it's part of it. It's all part of it. But what I would say is, you know, go back to the fundamentals of it. And this was written around 1950, 1960, something like that, by a chap called Philip Kotler. And still to this day, he's right. You know, there's basically four things, uh, four P's of marketing that you might be learning about. So there's product, price, promotion, place. There's also theories that there's seven. So there's physical environment and people and blah, blah, and all these things. But focusing on the four is a good thing. So figure out who your target market is and figure out what products they want, at what price, how you'll reach them, and where they can get it. So it's fairly straightforward. However, since the 1960s, things have changed. So the modern marketer, and some of you have become marketers and brand people, etc. this is what you're needing to do now and, and try and understand. So you need to be half artist and half scientist. So you have to understand the value of beautifully written content, but then on the other side, the beautifully written content has to be read by Google in a certain way for you to rank, for you to get the sale online. So it all goes hand in hand. So from that point of view, it's really great if you're interested in the, the fluffier side and the more creative side of stuff, but you're also kind of switched on by the maths of it all and the behavior and, and things like that. So if you can understand the two things together, you're going to be a really powerful marketer and make a lot of money. Because um, this is what people are looking for. Someone that understands brand, marketing, art, science, social media, digital, TV, everything. So, you know, it's quite a lot to go at these days. So when you're then getting into your, your planning side of things, there's only ever one strategy, and that's your brand strategy. Everything else is a plan. It's a good tip to think that way. But always strategy before tactics. And the biggest mistake a lot of your future colleagues make is that they basically do not understand this and they go out with tactics. I'm going to do a poster. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's just all ticky tacky rubbish. You know, go into the boxing match or the chess match, whatever football match with a strategy and then you can get tactical. So here's the difference. I always used to struggle with what the difference was. So the strategy is in this example, take the river and the tactics are, you take the boat. So 
the thing is, if people, you know, stuck to them thinking that tactics first, they'd be carrying about a boat if they could carry it. And there might not even be a river. It might not be the best way to get there. So really think about that. It's a really, um, you know, big point. This is a more in-depth one, and it's something I studied lately in, in a, a couple of mini MBAs that I did just to kind of refresh my, my knowledge. Now, this is a great tip. Use this map if you're ever marketing planning. And if your boss or anyone says this isn't the way to do it, then leave the company immediately, right? Because they're terrible at their job. So what happens is most businesses start at the bottom. I've got a product that I want to shift and I'm going to then, nobody wants it, so I give it a promotion 50% off and I might sell some. Best way to go about all this is go wind all the way back up to the top here and say diagnosis. What is the problem? You know, what's the problem you're trying to solve for customers? And then you get into market research where you go and study customers in the wild. You know, you actually see them using your product and your service and see how they interact with it. And you do call and quant research. So um, either way, you can do qualitative first and then quantify it, or you can call it and quantify it and then qualify it. So it doesn't, either way. Um, I usually prefer to do the quantity side of things, the numbers first, and then qualify it in focus groups, but everyone's different. Then you get into market segmentation. Forget your brand and all that for a second. With the product, area that you're in, service area that you're in, what's the entire market? How does it break down? Who's in it? Who makes what? All that. What do you think you might be able to get? What's the size of the prize? And what are all the audiences? And then you stand back from the whole thing and say, I wonder what I should target out of all that to get the best return. Then against that target, you'll do positioning. So a very good example is um, Alexa advertising, mm -hmm. uh, Alexa speaker, which is you know, basically, Sorry, oh, it's gone sure. off. <laughs> so with the speaker, the Amazon speaker, then what happens is if it's a, for an elderly person, it would be a companion and they could market it that way. If it's the person that's going to buy it is a parent for an older parent, then they would sell to them and say it's peace of mind for them. But if it's for a kid, it's so that it makes, you know, rude sounds and, you know, says swear words and whatever, or it can stream the music without looking up. So it depends, you know, each product you can actually position very differently, which is quite interesting. And then what's the best position for the customer, the company and against the competition? And then you get down to the place that most people start at. What's the price of it all? But that should be heavily strategized. Where can you get it? Is it online? Is it direct? You get it through a reseller? How does it work? and then the product and the promotion. So strategy first, then tactics. Many tactics, one strategy. So what's the what's marketing really? So again, talking about uh, Kotler, you know, again, really recommend looking at his stuff, but marketing is the science and art of exploring, creating and delivering value to satisfy the needs of a target market at a profit, very important. Marketing identifies unfulfilled needs and desires. It defines, measures, and quantifies the size of the identified market and the profit potential. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, but if you break it all down, you can start to see really what you're there to do if you're a marketer. And it really isn't to create beautiful adverts. You know, it's to fulfill this. So you're sort of really kind of hypnotizing people slightly um, in terms of what it is that you're wanting to do. So, you know, go back in time and learn the history of the business. Speak to old timers as well as founders and understand that all oh, this is really vital. And then from the attention side of things, that's the biggest asset that you've got. Define and understand the target market, talk to them and find out what they want and where their attention is. So competitors, define your competition and then anyone who can take a pound, euro or dollar from you is your competitor understand them, what they do, who their teams are, and what they're targeting with what. So for example, your sushi, it's not just other sushi restaurants that are, you know, you're up against. It could be at lunchtime, someone going to Boots for a meal deal. It could be that they've brought in their own sandwich. So from that perspective, you know, really be aware about anyone that could take money from you and why. Figure out what happened as well. So look at what happened over the past year in terms of sales, sales mix and profitability and how the competitors performed. That's a really, really big thing to do. And then in terms of your yeah, positioning, 
Two, which audience? What product are you going to sell them? What are their alternatives? And then up to three reasons of why you are better than they are. Create your positioning, yeah, for each target, uh, each target market. So, you know, that's going to help you do that. That little framework is brilliant for that. I've used it for years and years and years. And then hopefully, you know, people are going to want to take your stuff. So use your insight to create product pricing and communications that will resonate with your target audiences. And then hopefully they'll be throwing money at you. And then stay on target. So plot your course, launch it, and hold the wheel. So even if you think it's going a bit wrong, you know, if you've done all your homework up front, it should pay off. You know, keep going. Look at how the customers are reacting and to what the and what the competitors are doing as a result as well. But stand firm and do not need you. You know, once you've made your decision on your strategy, stick to it. It will pay off. And then, unfortunately, your reward for having a great strategy is uh, doing it all over again. So track, measure, make adjustments, and then do the whole thing over again. And then that's your perpetual life in marketing, really. But once you've nailed this process, you know, it will be a lot of joy for you and to teach other people as well. And after that, hopefully it goes from, you know, a couple of people talking about your product to lots of people hearing about your product. And then eventually, you know, people shouting at the stadium, loads of people about how great your product is in terms of word of mouth and your marketing reaching them. So if you've ever going to have, you know, sleepless nights or anything like that, I've got a podcast that you might be interested in. So talking to everyone from Fat Boy Slim to, um, you know, the CEO at Pizza Express, et cetera, et cetera. So lots in there, lots of great free advice. You'll be able to find that on iTunes and also Spotify, Amazon, et cetera, to listen to. And if you need anything at all, I'm always here to help. So my email address is mark at supersonic.marketing and drop me a wee line and I'll try and help you as much as I can. And that's it. So I think we're just going to take some questions if there was any time left. Yes, we have. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, that was an amazing insight into firstly your journey, but also just into the industry in general. Um, I think the thing I found most interesting is what you were saying about, you know, if you have good branding, people just pay the money, don't they? You know, like you were saying about Starbucks, I go and spend more money on a Starbucks because they hook you in with the right branding and marketing yeah. um we've got five minutes so i'm going to rattle through some questions to you as we've had lots come through and um, so the first one is saying do you think that it is necessary to get a marketing degree in order to have a um successful career or do you think that there are other degrees you could do um and still have a good career yeah yeah i mean not necessarily um i i did it and, and i found that five ten percent helpful you know um but i would advocate maybe learning on the job so you know in, in, in that sense so once whatever you're studying um then you go into a marketing job or a brand job or a business job then you know there's there's lots of time for you to brush up on areas so you can get in find out what you're more interested in and then it might not be marketing at all it might be pricing that you love or you know and then you can sort of further hone that so there's always opportunities to learn along the way um so no i mean I, I, as i say i probably use five or ten percent of my degree ever but then you know it, that's the time thing as well you know i went to university before the internet was happening right so from that perspective you know a lot's changed so you've had you've had to just learn on the job so yeah i'm always a bit torn i mean if you do something that's completely out you know at odds with marketing it might be a little bit weird um but you know I, i'm working with a great guy at the moment who's the lead strategist for the army and um, for, for the army's recruitment you know and he's, he's done a wonderful job but he studied like fine arts at oxford and because he's done that he's obviously of a certain level of intelligence he can turn his hand to anything um but yeah so i, I don't think you have to I, I think it helps i mean i think there's a certain amount of confidence in job interviews of old that i used to say i've got this bit of paper that says i, I know what marketing's all about um, but I think if you're enthusiastic and you've got the right attitude and you'll make things happen. I mean, a good a good thing to look at actually is um, Thursday, the dating app. There's a new dating app called Thursday. Um, if you look on LinkedIn and you look at their advertising and they've got like a wee intern in and she's done the most incredible stuff. She got a guy 
to stand outside of, and I don't even know if she's, she's studying marketing, but she got a guy to stand outside Liverpool Street Station in Euston Station with a sandwich board on saying, I cheated on my girlfriend last Thursday. <laughs> you no, know? and like he's getting shouted at in the street and it became viral and, you know, but it was all from them. But she's come up with these super clever ideas. So I, I think there's no, yeah, there's no uh, set, set way where the ideas should come from. So I wouldn't worry about it. You can learn as you go as well. Either or. Yeah, sometimes doing work experience or something can help you decide or, you know, I know that there's a lot of degrees that will still brush upon marketing if they're kind of in that kind of vague genre. Um, that's really useful. Thank you. And then the next question says, what do you think are the top five skill or traits that you would need to be successful in any business? What successful what traits? Um, skills or traits, what do you think well, someone needs to be successful in business? Um, basically, say yes to everything. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's sad that you have to say it, but I, I've, I've done, I don't mean so well, but I've done okay because um, I was first, I was always first in and last out. Um, so I kind of dedicated my life to it a bit, you know, so... I, I think I, I put life, you know, on a back burner a bit, and, and you know, I wanted, I, I was hungry for it. Um, I think you need to be a joy to work with. Um, I think you should learn to never give your boss any or, or a client, depends what it is you're doing, uh, any problems. You know, don't don't come to your boss or your client with a problem ever. Um, so have it solved or have recommendations. You can go, this is going really badly, but here's five things I think you should do. Um, and then I think one of the other things, there's a couple of bits of advice I got. One was, uh, if there's a vacuum, fill it. So if you see anything going on that you're stepping up for, or you could step up for, go and do it. You know, just stick your hand up and go, I'm in. So I'm doing that to this day. So um, there's a huge shortage of people working in hospitality right now. So I stuck my hand up to say, I'll do an advertising campaign and I'll do it for, I'll give my time for free. Um, and now we're raising five million pounds to put this on TV and TikTok and all these things um, to do it. And then out of that, your reputation, you know, people think, oh, you must be a good guy who's doing that. So it's that kind of thing. So just, you know, put your hand up. Um, and then the other great bit of advice I thought was um, don't let anyone stand in your way of you doing your job. Um, and my boss told me that when I was a kid and he said, not even me. So that gave you the authority to get the job done. It made you a little bit more tenacious to get, you know, don't accept no for an answer. Um, but what's the whole thing? It says don't don't ever quit because then it becomes a habit. So just try never to, you know, be, be persistent and, and, and you'll be noticed, you know? Yeah, yeah. get that hard work in. Yeah. Thanks. I'm going to ask um, maybe just two more questions. Yeah. So the next one is how did you get into the industry? Maybe how did you get your first job? So uh, I did mechanical engineering uh, for a year at university. I found the pub uh, and failed miserably. So my second choice then was, uh, after I failed, was marketing. Um, and I was really into music, still am. And uh, basically I, I went to do a, a music marketing degree. Um, but uh, one of my old teachers uh, came in to see me at a record shop I worked in. And he said, um, don't do that. So I cancelled it. And he said, do marketing, not music marketing. So that was what I did. I did look wide. And then he goes, you can always work in music later. He goes, learn all of it. And then, you know, so that was a good piece of advice. And then my first job, uh, I was a student brand manager for uh, the music magazine. So Enemy, Loaded, uh, Melody Maker, Music, uh, Uncut, all these. And yeah, so that was the late 90s in, in London. Um, and all it was, I took that job at university. I, you know, I kind of worked quite hard at it. And then there was one job for 20 of us at the end of it and I'd performed the best. So I got the, I got the job. Um, so that was kind of how I, that was my first job in marketing. And then from there, a few more agencies, then lastminute.com. And then that was it from there. You, you know, you get your kind of career job and then it'll, it'll spur you on. So yeah, that was, that was it. It was great. Marketing was brilliant. It's good fun. Thanks, Mark. Um, and just one more question. Do you have any advice to give someone when they are writing their CV that could help them to stand out? Yes. So I've done this a few times, actually. I mean, it's different. It's a bit different now because of technology, right? But when I got that NME job, 
I did my CV as a music magazine, sort of back in the day. So I pulled in favours from uh, student mates that were artists, and you know, and I got them to to do it all. So that stood out. Um, I remember uh, at Yo Sushi, I got a, I got my job there. I sent them a ransom note, and and I said, help. I've been captured by a bunch of bankers. So I was working for Butler uh, you know, help me kind of thing. Um, and I was away, I was at a gig at Seen Bois in, in Hyde Park and, uh, and I got a phone call saying, can you come in tomorrow? You know, they thought this was great. And then I think I sent them some other tactical things that were like um, a story of how my father was a fisherman and my mother was something else. And this has made the perfect person to work at your sushi and blah, 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 what rubbish. But, it, you know, it got their attention, you know. Um, so I think there's that. I think technology-wise, you can go into Google and just say, what's the best CVs out there? And, and take some inspiration from them. I would say so much is online right now that you could do some things offline. So well, there's a good online thing. If you go, if you go online and you write Gary Vaynerchuk CV, I think it's Kendrick Lamar. Anyway. Someone, someone's album, and this particular guy a couple of years ago, um, sort of like superimposed himself onto an album cover, and he did a rap about why he should work at this agency, and and it went it went viral, and, and he did really well. But the other thing is, I'd say, use the post and and use the internet. So, for example, if you're going for a job with someone, you could stalk them online, and you could understand that they're a Man U fan, or they love the Beastie Boys, whatever it is. And then what you could do is you could send them something fun. It's not bribery, it's just getting their attention. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you one that really stood out to me was um, it was a brand agency were trying to get my attention at your sushi, and I never picked up my phone because we always sales things. I just couldn't, you know. Um, anyway, I was away for a couple of weeks, and I came back to the office, and there was a huge package on my desk. And I opened it, and it was a bird cage, this beautiful, ornate, massive bird cage, right? And then inside it, it had on the perch, uh, if you love your brand, set it free. And then, I, so I got in touch with agency and I saw him, he used them for a couple of things. So that, just that little lateral thought where you're going to stick up above a pile of paper that's been printed out. or And in fact, my friend Rosie, she used to work at Meat Liquor. She's now working at Patty and Bun. And she sent uh, sort of sweets and balloons and all this to, to this lady who was hiring and she was just going off on maternity leave. She sent a whole big kind of maternity pack and stuff. So there's those kind of ways. That's the way you do it. You know, where someone goes, God, they've made an effort. You, you, you'll get thank. I mean, be good in your interview too, by the way, you know. But for you to get the interview, um, I would see it as step one. And that, that's how you would go about it. Yeah, I think outside the box, especially yeah. in this kind of industry, I think yeah. it's not, you know, yes, a piece of paper with all of your qualifications can be impressive, but actually what they want to see is you doing it practically. They want to see what you can do. So market, market yourself. Yeah. You know, market yourself. There yeah. we go. Well, you know, I think, so if your job that you're going for is worth 25,000 pounds a year, let's say, then surely sticking a hundred quid behind it makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'd, I'd, maybe look at, I'd maybe look at something like that. But, you know, even like you were saying, taking the initiative to just know what their interests are or the fact that they even know that you've clicked on their website and seen something and gone, OK, that to them. I know that most people want someone who cares. They don't want someone who just wants the job for the money. They want someone who wants the job because they're passionate about the job. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'd rather work with someone who takes the time out of their day to get to know who I am yeah. rather than just saying, oh, give me a job please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Um, we are unfortunately out of time, but uh, it's been so insightful and I'm sure everyone watching has really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sending in all your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all, but we did have some great questions come through. Um, so that is now a wrap on our session. Just a reminder for those of you who are watching, please do not forget to get your work submitted and get the programme completed by the 12th of November to be eligible for your certificate. If you need any reminders, you can find all the important dates in module one. So just go there if you need any reminders.
this. Thank you again to Mark for taking the time out of your day. We really appreciate it. Good luck with the rest of your program, everyone, and we will see you very soon.